When was history invented? That is a question without a real answer. People have been telling stories about the past for as long as we are able to recover the past. And those stories, whatever their basis, could reasonably be referred to as history. In fact, we tend to refer to ancient writers like Simarchian or Herodotus as historians with no irony or caveat, while we recognise at the same time that if you wrote history like that today, you would be incompetent. I'm sure everyone who listens to this channel understands that there are lots of ways of talking about the past, and that professional historical practice is a very specific one. That historical method has changed and improved over time, and that it has diverged from the way poets, novelists, filmmakers or politicians talk about history. It's not better in an absolute sense, just superior at the narrow objective the discipline has set itself, ever since there was a professional discipline, of recovering what happened. There isn't a single moment that you can point to and say this. This is when the discipline we call history was invented. But there are lots of moments which each contributed to that development and distinctiveness. And there are lots of opinions on which of those moments is the most important. Today, we will look at the French historian Marc Bloch's answer to that question, which has the virtue of precision. Bloch argues very specifically that history was invented in 1681. OK, a little bit about Marc Bloch. Bloch was a French historian and one of the founders of what is known as the Annals School, named after the journal Annals de Histoire Économique et Sociale, founded in 1929. The Annals School had a huge impact on the theory of history, particularly marks a shift in what history was about. Before its professionalisation, writers had been concerned with public life, politics, wars, occasionally high art or the church, but only really in the sense that they impacted on politics and thus were connected with wars. As the title of the journal suggests, the Annals School extended that remit, obviously to the social and economic, but in principle to every aspect of human activity. Bloch himself is a complex figure in this respect. He is best remembered for his work on peasant life, agriculture and superstitions like the royal touch. But of course, he had been schooled in an older historical tradition, so he did write on war and politics, his final work actually being on the French defeat in 1940, a conflict he fought in. He died fighting with French resistance just a few weeks after Allied forces landed at Normandy. And the book we will talk about today, The Historian's Craft, I'm going to use the English title, the French actually begins A Defence of History, was actually published posthumously based on an incomplete draft by his colleague, Lucien Fevre. Bloch is an interesting figure in his own right, but today I want to talk about his claim that history was invented in 1681. The thing to understand about the historian's craft is that it is pedagogic in nature. Bloch is not trying to write a history of his discipline. He is illustrating the methods of his discipline through a story about its development. As such, it doesn't matter much to Bloch, who at this time had rather limited access to libraries, if it is necessary to take a few liberties with 17th century intellectual thought. All of which being said, what happened in 1681? The answer is the publication of De Re Diplomatica Libre Sex, or Six Books on Diplomatics, by the Benedictine monk Jean Mabillon. It is to this publication, and Mabillon's approach to the study of documents, that Bloch attributes the invention of the critical method, which he sees as the foundational element in the modern discipline of history. This is a fairly lengthy argument. It occupies 48 pages in my copy, and it has multiple digressions, which means I'm going to need to break it up here. We'll start with diplomatics. Then we can ask what the problem was that Mabillon was trying to solve. And finally, we can follow Bloch's argument as to how Mabillon's solution can be generalized into a tool for historians. 
Diplomatics is the study of documents, particularly the authenticity of documents. Is this text genuine? Is it as old as it claims to be? Was it really composed by the person it says it was composed by? And so on. Generally, diplomatics is concerned with the physically surviving text, and it is not directly interested in composition or interpretation. This is a much narrower inquiry than something like source criticism. And it is also still very much alive as a historical subdiscipline, especially in medieval European history. But it did not begin as a historical discipline. Mabillon and his contemporary Papenbroek, whose importance will become apparent in a moment, were not writing history in our modern sense. They were both concerned with the lives of saints, preparing detailed accounts of each and every Christian saint, which brought them into contact with a problem how to deal with fake records. They were not the first people to think about this. This was an already established legal problem, because these documents did not just record the lives of the pious, they might also be charters granting certain rights or lands to a particular monastery. One method for resolving disputes over suspected documents, still used in the legal sphere today, was the concept of jus archivi, the good archive. The idea that certain repositories were authoritative and thus you could trust the documents found in those archives without reference to the documents themselves. Bloch glosses this approach as credulity. You believe anything you find in a certain type of document. And while perfectly sound from a legal point of view, this is the principle on which the tax office, the DVLA or the land registry operate in your everyday life. It wasn't going to cut it for the lives of the saints. It was just blindingly obvious that some of these documents were spurious. But which ones? In 1675, Daniel von Papenbrock prefaced the second volume of the lives with a discussion of the problem and offered a solution. Now, here I'm going to be honest with you, I haven't read any of these. All of these 17th century works are accessible online, but as far as I know, there are no English translations you need to read them in Latin, and the bulk of the scholarship on them is in French and German. But this doesn't really matter because this is not history, it's just a story Bloch wove to illustrate a methodological point. Papenbrock's solution was scepticism. He knew some of the documents were fake, so he argued you should discard all of the documents which give any reason for doubt. This had some political implications, there were some very old charters in the monastery of Saint-Denis in Paris, and their age alone would raise doubts. But these charters were central for the Benedictine order, Mabillon's order, which could not simply accept their dismissal. Obviously, given that Papenbroek's position was a sincere attempt to overcome clear problems with credulity and the concept of jus archivi, these documents could not be honestly defended simply by asserting Saint-Denis's reputation. What Mabillon needed was a better criteria for sifting the documents, one which did not require significant numbers of legitimate documents to be thrown out with the spurious ones. And it is this approach, diplomatics, which he laid out in response in 1681, and which, though not as neatly as Bloch implies in his account, won the day and became the standard historical approach. Mabillon rejected the idea of assessing the documents either by reference to an external authority or by individually examining them. Instead, he argued, you had to see the documents as a group and make a careful study of every aspect of them in order to understand the language, procedure and habits of the people who wrote them and thus weigh their veracity. Bloch describes it as follows. We can never establish a date. We can never verify in short, we can never interpret a document except by inserting it into a chronological series or a synchronous whole. It was by comparing Merovingian charters, now with each other, now with other texts of a different nature and time, that Mabillon founded the science of diplomatics. Bloch now shifts gear and begins to generalise from the narrow question of authenticity to the much broader question, what historians actually do which is to interpret evidence. He begins by extending the notion of fraud. Fraud, 
he suggests, does not have to be binary, nor does it have to be a lie. First, he divides it into two types. Actual forgery, the subject of diplomatics, which would lead to the discarding of a piece of evidence, and misrepresentation, which is a different order of problem and requires interpretation. Writing on this second category, to establish the fact of forgery is not enough. It is further necessary to discover its motivations, if only as an aid to tracking it, so long as there is any doubt about its origins, there is something in it which defies analysis and which is therefore only half proved. Within misrepresentation, Bloch begins to lay out a series of possibilities through examples, the general thrust of the argument being that there are many reasons for misrepresentation and that simple deceit is not just the least interesting, it is also relatively uncommon. This leads into one of the lengthy digressions that marks the whole text, in this case on the psychology of witnesses. When Bloch has finished his digression, he is now positioned to consider the simplest case, that two or more conflicting accounts of an event. In doing so, he begins to introduce the concept of discrimination as a central part of the critical method. Through further examples, he makes the argument that if contradictory accounts survive, at least one of them has to be, at least in part, rejected. But criticism is not simply a matter of finding differences. It is, Bloch argues, fundamentally comparative, and so it is also a matter of finding similarities. And sufficient similarity would also lead to the rejection of one or more pieces of testimony. Using these examples, Bloch lays out what he believes is the generalizable principle in historical criticism, the concept of limited similarity. Reality, he argues, possesses sufficient uniformity that there is a limit to the honest deviation between witnesses. But there is enough subjectivity that spontaneous repetition simply does not occur. The text makes no excuse that any of this is easy. It is described as a subtle art, and it is commented that there is no recipe for it. But the argument remains that it is a rational basis for the evaluation of sources, one capable of repeated application. Up to this point, the text has been mostly concerned with narrative accounts, mimicking the 19th century's obsession with the written word. But increasingly, material culture is added to the examples, and a lengthy digression on statistics demonstrates the way that the annals historians had expanded the notion of what was historical evidence. It also gives Bloch an opportunity to demonstrate the principle of limited similarity on something far removed from Mabillon's charters, and thus illustrate its generalizable nature. Okay, so I suppose it's obligatory for me to say this because I'm introducing Bloch's idea of where history originated. I think he's wrong. I think critical method is clearly an important step, but I do not think it is quite the central step that he believes it to be. However, we are looking at a book today, this one here, so I think it's time to look at the reactions of his contemporaries. Let's look at the reviews. There were reviews in 1915-51 of the original French edition, in 54-55 of the English translation, and some in the 1990s, though I've not managed to access any of those, based on the republication of the edition that I'm reading. And they are marked by their variety of interpretation. Some reviewers focus, as I have, on chapter 3. Others think chapter 1 or 4 are the critical elements. Fevre, Bloch's colleague who wrote the introduction, thought that the really interesting stuff was actually in the unwritten chapters that would have followed. For some, this is fundamentally about the philosophy of why history is done, and the examples of practice are trappings. For others, it is essentially a handbook of how you do things, and the philosophy is derivative. But I think almost all of the reviewers recognise that this is a very unusual book. Textbooks are rarely written by first-rate historians, and philosophical defences are rarely offered by actual practitioners. Bloch moves easily between the two. And while he tries hard to make what he writes clear, he never pretends that there are easy answers. The feature that I find most interesting 
And the reason I focused on chapter three today is the sense of disciplinary progress in the book. Historiographic texts written by Bloch's contemporaries and successors often lose sight of the fact that the discipline has advanced. But this book embraces it, and just as Bloch recognises the superiority of his tools over those of his predecessors, so he clearly expects his successors to outstrip him. As a number of reviewers have noted, that is a surprisingly positive note, given that this was written by a Jewish academic in occupied France. Finally, what would I recommend as a reading? So this is usually something that I do at the end of talking about any particular book, is to suggest a particular section that I think would make an interesting reading. Well, to be honest, I'm reluctant to do so here. I'm not sure there is a substantive section you can read and get a flavour of the whole or any key argument. Reviewers have widely disagreed over which part is most important. My inclination is to say you should just read the whole book. There is no chore in that, and while it has dated, it's still close enough to our modern practice to seriously engage with. On the other hand, if you were to break it up, I don't think it is useful to try and pick out a lengthy substantive part as representative. The book is just packed with ideas, and if you want a classroom discussion, you would be better off taking just one point and using that as a seed to develop. In fact, that's what I ultimately decided in this case. Rather than just pick one particular section out, I thought I would defer the recommend readings to a new video, and for that, I will prepare a list of what I think are the most interesting questions that Block raises. 